Hey everybody, welcome to the Level Up Leadership Podcast. My name is Mike Delgado. My name is Patty Guevara. This podcast is designed to help you get to know the leaders here at Experian and also gain insight into the leadership skills and traits needed to grow our careers. In this podcast, we'll talk mentorship, career navigation, handling rejection, work-life balance, mental health, diversity and inclusion, and so much more. A lot of our recordings are done through WebEx, so sometimes the audio quality is not perfect. We apologize. We'll get better in time, uh, but we hope you get a lot of information out of these shows. We certainly have. Enjoy the show. Today, we're talking with Mike Bremer, Vice President of Experian Data Breach Resolution and Consumer Protection. If you could just tell us about your background, educational and professional, and then a little bit about what you do here at Experian. Sure. So um, I am, I'm Mike Bremer. I'm responsible for the global data breach business and also have a sort of secondary role as being a spokesperson for consumer protection. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be speaking in the next week or so doing a little media tour on our 2020 predictions for the data breach business. And it's the seventh year in a row that we've done this. And, and we've got some real good ones. And I can probably come back to that later. But I was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I graduated. I did two years of undergrad at Wake Forest University, so I'm not only a demon deacon, but I <laughs> finished up at Wisconsin, and I'm very, very proudly a cheesehead as well as a Badger fan. Uh, and one of the things that uh, people know about me when I tell my story is that I did the typical jobs working, mowing lawns and caddying at a golf course, but the, the one that made the biggest mark on me when I when I put myself through school working in a slaughterhouse at Oscar Meyer doing all the jobs on a kill floor and then Whoa. going into the union for a year or two years and then flipping over and to be a supervisor when I was a junior in college and supervising a crew of people that were twice my age wow. so I learned a lot in a very short period of time not only good work ethic, but how do you lead people without being in a position where you can say, do as I say, not as I do, because you didn't have any credibility when you were just a kid in college and some people were almost my parents' age. Mm. So it, it was a very, uh, it, was a, it was an interesting time and I learned a lot. And then I moved around quite a bit with my jobs with Oscar Mayer, with PepsiCo, and I had an opportunity to spend a total of about seven years overseas in two different trips with PepsiCo in Western Europe, Northern Europe, and then Eastern Europe, wow. refranchi refranchising some communist bottling operations to be company-owned operations. And as I, as I tell people, one of the things that's most interesting if you're a United States citizen is when you get outside the United States and you realize that the U.S. Uh, isn't the center of the universe yeah. for a lot of other places and, all, and a lot of other cultures out there to experience. And so that that's kind of what has made me who I am. Those experiences growing up and then traveling overseas definitely impacted uh, me from a, both a personal and a professional aspect because I met my wife over in the UK, she worked for our British bottler, Britvik Soft Drinks, and when I was at PepsiCo, and have been married almost 30 years. Mm. Um, we have four kids, and I'm proud to say that I've got another half a semester left before I get the last one off the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Um, can we go back to you being in college and getting put in a position to now managing people who are much older than you and you're so young. Um, I think that a lot of us would probably feel very uncomfortable and even not even sure how to do this, how to maneuver, um, especially with your age. Can you talk about how you kind of dealt with that? 
Well, Mike, what what helped me most, honestly, was having the the two years prior where I actually was a union member and I worked in the slaughterhouse as well as I worked in the, um, well, it was basically small meat uh, department, but I, I had I had to be disciplined. I had to understand the rules of the road. I was making a lot of money at the time. I mean, I can remember it was $10.76 an hour in 1975, 76 that I was making. So that was a lot of money. But I realized I didn't want to be in that position. That wasn't a long-term career. And I thought the best way for me to, to um, expand my horizons was just to ask to come back as a supervisor and I was really lucky, and, and it was fortuitous that my boss was the grandson of Oscar Meyer. Wow. His name was Hal Meyer, and, and he was working his way through the management ranks, and he happened to be my, my supervisor. And he, he told me, he said, Mike, all you do, have to do is be yourself. Don't act like you know it all. Want to learn and want to help out, and you'll be just fine. Mm. And it was those simple pieces of advice that overcame the fact that I was much younger than the, the other folks. And maybe I was much different than other supervisors who would have come in and tried to boss them around, do as I say, not as I do type of attitude. Mm-hmm. So I, I took the high road and I had a bunch of guys on second and third shift. And when you're on second and third shift in a big meat packing plant, especially third shift, you don't have anybody to turn to. I, I saw my bo- boss once a day, and it was at the end of the shift when I was getting off in the morning. So, yeah, I could have phoned a friend, but if something went sideways, mm. it was you know people's uh, lives were in my hand because we were we were operating smokehouses, we were moving um, palletized stacks of meat that were a couple thousand pounds. I mean, it, there was it's kind of a dangerous situation. So you better have been right on, you better have been safety conscious, you better have been respectful of your elders, so to speak. And it worked out quite well. We got along fine. I mean, there, there's lots of stories I probably wouldn't want to tell on this, but <laughs> uh, for, the, for the most part, I did okay. Uh, what were some things that you learned about being a good leader during that period of time that you have taken with you? Well, to this day, I subscribe to the, the simple form of leadership. You got to have a vision. And then more importantly, you got to get other people to follow that vision. And that was so true, even working in this situation with Oscar Meyer. And I always thought it was important that every night when everybody came in, we all came together and they weren't doing it when I when I took over the place. Um, we sat down for about 15 minutes and we talked about what was expected, what production we had to do and during that shift, what happened on first shift or second shift. And then we always had a mutual expectation. Okay, here's where we're gonna finish. Here's what's gonna get completed. Here's where we have to, um, do our part as part of the value chain of what was expected for the department for the week. And nobody had done that before with these guys. So they felt like, oh, wow, I get it. I get the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And then last but not at least in this process about getting other people to, to follow you is that once they understood what needed to be done, I always spent time with everybody, even if it was walking alongside of them just talking about what was happening with their job or if they needed some extra help i'd get them some extra help and put two guys on a on a task they felt like okay here's a guy who really understands and is trying to help me out and of course you the you think everything's fine until you're faced with your first challenge and i realized when something went bad when we had a smokehouse breakdown in that first summer and we had to move some product and I had guys not only from my department but other department came over to help 
And as many people know in a union environment, you don't help other people out with their job. That's normally, it's, it's not my job, I'll stick mm-hmm. to my stuff, it's not allowed to do that. My guys were much more of, hey, wait a minute, we gotta get this done. We're all in this together. We like the situation. Let's let's all pitch in. And and when when it happened the first time, I was like, oh wow, is this supposed to be that way? And I talked to some of my other peers in other departments that were supervising. They going, I can't even get my guys to do their own job, let alone help help uh, <laughs> someone else out. So I felt pretty fortunate. So I, I learned at that point that the the idea that. It, Letting people know the big picture, helping them out, giving them, you know, taking roadblocks out of their way, giving them resources, or also helping coach them. Because I was also proud to say that the summer after um, I left as a supervisor, one of my guys on my first crew became a supervisor as well. And it was mm-hmm. partly because I'd recommended him and spent some time with him. So I, w- I was very, um, it was a great memory and a great way to start in leadership. You mentioned earlier that um, you realized at one point that you didn't want to make a career out of your job at the slaughterhouse. I'd like to know more about how you came to that realization and what the process looked like pivoting your career into something else. I could give you a really good glamorous answer, but (laughs) you're sitting at three three o'clock in the morning and you're in a blast freezer that's minus 17 below and you have to uh, help wow. some guys move frozen meat out to thaw for the first ship production and then two of the guys go home because they're sick and you still got to get stuff done and you look up into the sky and you go what the hell am I doing here that's how I decided I didn't want to do this for a living. Right, right. <laughs> and what was your next move? What did you decide to move into after that? Well, I I liked the environment so much, and I was very appreciative that Oscar Meyer gave me an opportunity to do a union job as well as a supervisory job for a couple summers. And so I went into what they call the pre-management training program. There were nine of us that were selected from all across the country. And we went through every front end office department because I'd already done the manufacturing side of it. And it got got to be a uh, mentee of one of the executives. And then I got assigned to my first um, plant outside of Madison. I went to Philadelphia where you think the unions were tough in Madison, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, the second night on the job, I had all four of my tires slashed in the parking lot. Oh, wow. Um, and then that same night, I had everybody walk off. I was the third shift superintendent. It was a smaller facility than the one in Madison, but they all walked off the job, and I had to call my boss and say, I don't think we're going to get started in the morning because everybody's walked off the job. What do I do? And he goes, they've walked off. They're insubordinate. We'll figure it out. I'll be in in a little bit. And he walked me through. We end up firing everybody and rehiring folks. We missed a full, full shift of production because of it. But he said, you, you did the right thing. You didn't flinch. These guys were just trying to test you and we're not going to put up with it. Mm -hmm. So, I also learned the value of having a boss who has your back, and that's really important for you to be successful, I think, in any role, and to be good in an organization, you have to have a boss that quote unquote has your back. And I've been fortunate in experience working now for David Proctor, but I worked for Jen Luer, um, worked for Guy Abramo and and under Ty Taylor, and all of them I can say always have had my back. I love that. And I'm, I'm curious now, um, as you manage your team, what are some ways that you are, um, you know, building relationships with your employees and having their back? It starts with, first of all, you have to be transparent. You have to be able to walk the walk and set an example. Um, You have to, again, back to one of my earlier answers, they have to know what the expectations are in the big picture and how does their role fit into 
what the big picture is and what you're trying to accomplish. And then I also think that you, you learn a lot um, with employees when the chips are down and you're working together in a different, difficult situation that they feel like we're coming together as a team. This isn't, I mean, there, there are not very many roles in Experian where it's just an individual competition. You have to rely on your teammates. And I think a, a leader de- differentiates themselves when they don't criticize, they don't ask a ton of questions, they come and they say, hey, how can I help you? No matter what the situation is, and, and do your peers and can your leader rally the rest of the team to help various people out in their individual times of need? I think that separates the, the people that just show up and are managers versus the people that are truly leaders. You mentioned earlier that you spent seven years overseas in various parts of Europe with PepsiCo. Um, I want to know how, or if you have any tips for leaders who might be going to another area of the world and how they can kind of make sure that their leadership style translates into that different culture, just because like you said, America's not the epicenter of the world. (laughs) So um, did you have any tips regarding that? Uh, Three things. One, culture is super important and you need to be understanding, respectful, and have spent time studying that culture. Mm -hmm. Um, Second, along with that, I think it's really important. You don't have to be uh, fully literate and conversational in the language, but you have to know enough to be dangerous. I use the example, um, one of my stops was in Slovakia, and I learned Slovak along with my wife. Oh my gosh. And we could understand just about any conversation. We could carry on uh, what I call daily life conversations around going to the, the Potrovini or going to a restaurant and that. But I never ever put myself in a position where I had to negotiate a contract in Slovak because I would have been a little bit over my head. But it <laughs> it meant a lot mm. to be in someone else's country and to appreciate the culture and and learn the language. And then third, always to be cognizant that you were a guest in somebody else's house, so to speak, and that it wasn't a you know you had to kind of subvert a, a little bit of your U.S. centric behavior, because it's easy to tell an American overseas in just about any country, but in Eastern Europe in particular, the further east you go, the more you stand out. So it's not always to be, um, it's just to be respectful and and blend in more. And I think that helps a great deal. It's being humble. And I I think that's one of the things that um, got us uh, we, we made very good friends wherever we lived overseas. We were invited in. In fact, one of the families that looked after our kids, um, we still keep in touch with after 25 years. Um, their kids have come over and stayed with uh, us in the States, and we still keep in touch with them versus social media and that. It's, it's kind of fun. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, is there Was there an actual moment where you realized you needed to kind of work harder at understanding the culture? Like, did something happen or did you just kind of walk into it knowing that there is going to be extra work to do? We planned on learning the, the language. The, the toughest thing, honestly, was every time you met, <laughs> every time you met with a business leader in Slovakia, there was always alcohol involved. I mean, you <laughs> with a store owner. <laughs> And I realized very quickly that I, you know, you have to go in, sit down with the shopkeeper when you're going out with one of the route drivers. And, and again, back to being able to, you know, you have to walk the walk, ride the route trucks. Even though I was the general manager for the business, I wanted to make sure I experienced everything from the ground up. But this idea at eight o'clock in the morning that you're doing uh, shots of the local lighter oh fluid and <laughs> you, you can't. You can't keep that up for 20 stops, otherwise you won't make it. Right, right. <laughs> so so it's, funny. it's good to experience the culture, but there are limits, and you have to appreciate, and there's times when you can say no. Um, the other one, the story I love, love telling, 
uh, about the culture is that, of course, in Eastern Europe in general, and, and particularly before the Velvet Revolution and the Berlin Wall coming down, bribery was rampant, especially right. with Western companies. It was a pay-to-play environment, and of course, not only was PepsiCo very strong about not doing it, it was my personal belief he didn't have to do it. So I, I set an example with my team, we're not going to pay bribes, we're never going to be in that situation. But what we had to do was be creative. So. We had problems with product approvals with the Slovak Ministry of Economics that was doing the product approvals. And what we found out was they said, you know, you're going to have to pay us to expedite this stuff, which was, there's nothing on the books about paying fees. And we said, no, we're not going to do it. I said, what's the real problem? So well, we don't have enough lab equipment to do all the testing. We're backed up here. And I said, what if we bought you new lab equipment? Could we get our stuff approved in, you know, uh, a faster time. And so what we did, we made a donation to the Department of Economics that, that did all this. Mm. And instead of having it take six weeks to get our products approved, we got it done in six days and Coca-Cola still had to wait for six weeks. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> That's crafty. I like that. <laughs> um, I love how you've kind of just very early in your career just kind of moved into these all these really interesting positions, um, being in leadership roles, moving to different countries. What was it, I, I guess, like what were some of the qualities you had that PepsiCo, um, Oscar Mayer, that they saw in you to elevate you into leadership roles so early on? I give a lot of credit to my parents. Um, they raised me with a pretty good self-esteem. They taught me that I can do anything that I put my mind to. And they also taught me never give up. Mm. And so to move overseas and try something new wasn't that big of a deal. And don't get me wrong, even moving to England the first time outside of the States to work there, I was quite frankly scared out of my wits. And we spoke the same language. We had you know, the UK is one of the cultures that's as close to the US as anybody maybe outside of Canada. And it still was tough. And so under the circumstances, um, I learned never to, to give up and to try certain things. And even something else my parents always taught me was, hey, Try, don't be afraid to try when you go to a restaurant, try something new or try different food or try something else. And when you're outside of your environment, especially in a foreign country, to do those things, obviously being careful helps you. And people are, uh, are appreciative of the fact that you're not just bringing your same old um, way of life over to their country and transplanting yourself. And so that helped me a lot. And I have a lot to thank my parents for just because of, of that and, and that learning. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting is like having that early support was really powerful for you. And it gave you that, that courage to go ahead and, and jump into these new opportunities. Um, even though it might not have felt super comfortable, but you're like, yeah, you know what? I, I can do this. Um, I'm gonna try this out. This will be a good learning opportunity for me. Um, how did you deal with some of the um, some of the fears early on? Because when you try something new, especially managing people, um, it's very easy to be fearful. Um, imposter syndrome can creep in. And I'm kind of curious like how you how you manage those feelings? There's um, a, an admiral uh, from Austin, uh, where I live, uh, General, uh, I should say, Admiral William McRaven. And he wrote a book, I think he's written one since this one, but the one he wrote was, it's called Make My Bad. And I love it because what it talks about in the whole premise of the book is for you to be a successful person, you need to have wins at every part of your day. Mm -hmm. 
And so getting out first thing in the morning, making your bed and making it look nice, and especially in the military, you know, for inspection, you got to bounce a quarter off and all that. <laughs> yeah. It was, a, it was something that he did every single day, took great pride in, and hey, he had a win. So to answer your question, Mike, whatever, whenever things got tough and whenever I was scared, whether it was business or personal, personally, I've always tried to get a win. It may be small, it may not be significant to other people, but I can say, hey, I'm making progress, I'm putting one foot uh, forward, I'm, I'm just chipping away at a, at a mountain of a problem, and I can say, I can do this. And the hardest step is always your first one, even when things are going well. But when things are down, you're just looking for a win. And so what I tried to do was always find that first win, and then, okay, I can get that one and the second one, and there you go. I like that. I'm curious about some of your routines that you do to kind of make sure that you're always having those wins to kind of keep you going. Do you have any like personal routines or routines at work that you're doing? Uh, kind of like what the Admiral says about making your bed. I'm kind of curious about what are some of your kind of routine wins that you are trying to accomplish every day or every week? Uh, I'm a morning person. I don't mind getting up early. Um, one of my routines uh, that I try to do with a group of buddies in town, and we we do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, is at 6 a.m. we go for a, I call it urban bike riding. So, yeah, we're on roads, we're a little off-road, but it's generally around Lake Austin. And living downtown, we have a wonderful trail that goes around Lake Austin and, mm. and that. So what we try to do is get up and we ride. So I love the fact that I can get exercise. I love the fact that I can hang around with a couple of guys you know, from work or old friends and we get a chance to chat too. We end up at the end of the ride, which is 20 or 25 miles, have a cup of coffee and we started our day right. Mm. Um, the other two things that I try to do regularly, um, I try to pray every day. Yeah. And that gives me a, um, a real grounding. Um, I have meditated, although I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I haven't kept up with that. Um, but I did learn to meditate and realized it wasn't as hard as I thought. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds a lot more complex than it is, but you, you need to simplify it. And then the other thing that I've really enjoyed, we've, we've had one of our sons that went through an addiction issue, and I'm really proud to say that um, in a week, he'll be two years sober and, and doing great. That's great. That's but awesome. participating in the Al-Anon program, which is the family side of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. So they're two separate groups, but the Al-Anon program and the 12 step process um, as supporting someone else, whether it's a child or you're a, a son or daughter of an alcoholic, it's a wonderful program. I can't say enough. Mm. And that they have daily readings, and I I use the daily readings in my business as well. And I think it's it's funny. We laugh at the Ellen on means. I said, you know, all business people should actually be forced to come to Ellen on meetings because they don't learn a lot about some of the disciplines and things to do. So mm -hmm. those are just a couple routines that I follow. But exercise is important, daily prayer, and then the Al-Anon program most recently. And, and I'm there can be a mess going on, right? There can be there can be illness, there can be problems, and kind of juggling all that can be at times very, very overwhelming. And I'm I wonder if you can kind of speak to kind of how you navigate those waters when life is tough at home and then you get to work and work is tough and how you kind mm -hmm. of navigate that. People that have worked with me or work for me or have been my colleagues um, know I'm pretty much an open book. So when I was going through the depths of when my son wasn't sober and had progressed from casual drinking to smoking pot um, and 
and eventually got into heroin, albeit briefly, which was great, but that it didn't go any further. Um, people knew what was going on. Now, it took me a while to be that open about that particular thing, but I wasn't going to hide it. I'm not, I'm not the type of person that, that tries to keep everything compartmentalized or private. It's just not my style. I'm, I, I believe that you need to use your resources around you, and there will be times when something goes bad at home yeah. and you may not be having the best day. And even though it's not intentional and everybody generally come, comes to work and tries to do their best thing, but sometimes you're not always on your game and you need to be able to be empathetic with those people that walk in that way. And you have to be real and to generate other people understanding that, that that's the environment that we operate here and experience. And I think experience, has done a wonderful job creating the environment where you can come in and be real. And if you do have issues, regardless of where, what's going on and how they are, there's a way, whether it's one of the employee resource groups, whether it's Helpline, whether it's your boss, um, it, we're very, very lucky. And I'm so proud of the fact, and, and I'm on social media quite a bit talking to other people about, look at what a great place Experian is for inclusiveness, for diversity, for being a great place for people from regardless of where they come from or what issues or opportunities they have. We've got a way to support you so that you can be the best employee uh, you possibly can be. And that's helpful too, but I, I think people for the most part when they know what is going on and what uh, is really happening, they're gonna rally around you and help you. It's it's much different and we're in a different age, maybe back in the 80s and I know it was different then. I was much, um, probably more different than my colleagues because I was open about a number of things that weren't necessarily popular at the time. And so maybe society's kind of caught up with the way I've always been open, but it's wonderful to be in that situation right now. And I can tell you that if you're carrying a load on your mind, it's okay to bring it in and to talk to somebody about because that's life. Mike, your bio says that you're also somewhat of a spokesperson for experience. So you serve as an expert for Wall Street Journal, American Banker, you've been on Fox Business, etc. Have you always been a good speaker? I don't know if I've been a good speaker, but I, when when people stood in line, everybody else backed up, and I didn't realize it, and I got picked. So, uh, <laughs> no, I. In all seriousness, I I enjoy telling a great story, and I have benefited from really good mentors that have helped me with public speaking. In fact, I was talking to someone else earlier about that. I had an executive coach when I was with Dell that they were really generous about offering this up to me and and they were tough as nails mm. about me just, you know, the old look at your videotape, you know, look how you twitch, look how you <laughs> um and ah and you oh, know no. touch your ear or look up and you know all this stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, I hated that so much. <laughs> But it was so good. And then the media training that, you know, between Greg Young and Jerry and Sandra Bernardo, they've been fabulous in helping me hone my skills. And, you know, last but not least, I like talking about the good stuff that we're doing because the things that we do, especially in the breach business, we actually help consumers dramatically either avoid suffering identity theft protection or in the depths of identity theft protection, we help them unwind the problems um, back to pre-event status. That's really good work. And I'm always delighted to tell people about that or even talking about other things like Boost or, or the things that we're doing with um, community service projects that we do, the ERGs. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in two ERGs here heavily in Austin as well, some other community service projects. I love telling people about that. So 
It's a, it's a pleasure. It's really not um, a task at all. I enjoy it. Do you have any tips for people you know don't have access to um, an executive coach or you know a PR team that'll help with media training on how they can hone in on public speaking? Because I know that's a it's an issue for a lot of people who want to be leaders. I started just keeping my eyes open and looking for somebody that I thought carried themselves well or even did you know a particular tactic or a situation because it's much different talking to a journalist over a phone versus being on a you know morning talk show when the lights are on cameras in your face and you got a a producer in your ear that you 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 learn tips of the trade and if you just are open to asking questions I've even found that people that don't know me or I've been referred to, especially when you go up and say, hey, you know, I understand you do this really well, or I, I read your article, or you were published uh, in this book and you talk to them, people are willing to help you. I, I haven't had anybody that's told me, hey, go pound sand when I've asked for, <laughs> for help. And it doesn't cost you anything. Right. And then the other thing too is if you think somebody does really well, you can watch now in the days of social media and YouTube and everything else, you can find a lot of self-help stuff. But one thing I would let people know in terms of sp- public speaking, you always have to be yourself and find a style that works, but you can learn how not to do it also from some people that you can just turn on the TV at night and go, you know what, that, that, that wasn't a very good statement or they weren't looking at the at the interview or or they weren't looking at the camera or they avoided the question you can learn a lot that way so there's a lot of in this day uh, day and age where everybody is a spokesperson and has access to media you can learn a lot just by sitting down in front of your computer Mike, you mentioned a few times about having mentors and even early in your career um, having someone who was looking out for you and giving you guidance i'm curious about some of the advice you've received over the years that has been maybe maybe painful at first, but has really, really helped you in improving your own leadership skills? I talked earlier about the pre-management training program, which was my first out of college job program that I went into with Oscar Meyer. And I had an executive who was, he was basically the head of operations for all of Oscar Meyer's name was Jerry Hegel. And he was a gregarious guy. Um, and he had me, you know, he, he coached me on, you know, even though there wasn't a competition as such for the program, there was, it was the old kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. And so he <laughs> said, Mike, this is how this thing works. <laughs> This is how life works. I want you to be the best. I'm going to, he was one of those guys, like, took me under his wing, like his son said, You're going to be the best. You're going to be the first one to complete your, this project. You're going to be the first one to show up at meetings and do all that. Mm. And I was doing really well the first half of the program. And I had a, uh, a, project that I missed the deadline on because I couldn't count on people and, uh, or I, I didn't organize the the engineers to come at the right time. I I can't remember exactly how it went down, but my, the head of the program sat me down and basically told me, hey, Mike, your poop does stink Mm. and you're not the greatest thing. You're not always going to win and you got to realize that and you better work that much harder when things are difficult. So the mistake that's not getting the engineers right and missing the deadline in the project. It's not fatal, but you've got to get off your high horse and think you're always going to be the best. And I'm like, wow, that was such Mm. a good message at the right time and a kick in the gut. Mm. And he did it in such a way that it was such a kick in the gut that it got my attention, but it motivated me in a positive way. And I thought, wow, it's wonderful. And, and then that's, I've taken that attitude all the way to today where if I have to deliver a tough message, I've realized, and Andy Meikle in our, our training 
um, that we've done most recently talked about this too, especially when you're having to exit somebody from the company. It says do it quickly, but do it um, with great caution and humbleness and um, don't be an ass when you're mm. when you're having to exit somebody out of the company. And I've always tried to, to do that when I del- have to deliver a, a tough message. Be direct, be humble, be fair, and do it quickly and move on. Kind of going off of that, when you're looking at the talent on your team, how do you separate the good people from the excellent? Uh, I would I would say three things. One, their ability to deliver results consistently time and time again. There are some people, particularly when you're in sales, you know, they can have a great year once, but they can't do it time in and time out. I'll use um, a guy who a lot of people know uh, in Experian has been around for a while, is Ozzy Fonseca. And when it comes to, he was salesperson of the year in 2013, and out of his 15 years here, he's been to the elite uh, trip, I think 11 times. Wow, jeez. And you just, you just don't do that unless you're really good and you can deliver results all the time. So deliver results consistently. The second thing is also be able to withstand difficult circumstances and work through those solutions on your own. Meaning that you run into a brick wall, you have something not go the way you need to, are you gonna work yourself to find a solution or suggest a solution? Doesn't mean you have to do it yourself, but how do you handle failure? Mm. And then last but not least, even in in an individual contributor position, how good of a team player are you? And I, I say that, one, because if you're a good team player, you'll get other people that will turn right around because you're a team player and willing to help people without any expectation of anything in return. Yeah. When the chips are down, if you're a good team player, you can always tell the good team players because people rally around them. They're not the boss. They're not because somebody said so. It's because other people want to pay back that favor. I like that. Really, really good advice. Michael, uh, before we started today's show, um, we were talking about some different topics that we could chat about, and you mentioned organizational agility. And when you said that, I was like, what? What, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about what is organizational agility and why is that something that's super important to you? I used a phrase earlier today, um, and it explains it in layman's terms what that, uh, the fancy HR term, organizational agility, Uh, means you can wallow with the hogs and soar with the eagles. You're not afraid um, when you're working on a project to get down in the weeds um, to go and do the stuff that needs to be done and work side by side, but you're also just as comfortable in walking into Craig Bounty's office and having a conversation with him and not being afraid to do that. It's also, on another dimension, creating relationships. I try to teach my kids who are either Zers or millennials Mm -hmm. in that range, it is not what you know, it's who you know, and it's the relationships that you build. I, I always think it is super important to reach out to as many people, whether it's through the places like LinkedIn, through community service, through your church, um, and of course, especially your employer, because it's a team game and you gotta know, you may not know exactly who you need to get to, but if you know somebody that can get you over or give you advice in that direction, it's invaluable. Um, There's someone on my team, Colette Parsons, who's worked for Experian now almost, I think it's more than 10 years, I believe, and if you need to know anybody in Experian in any division and how to get there, she may not know that person, but she's going to know 
who's going to find that person and how to get there and get stuff done. Mm. And that's really important, especially in our matrix environment. Yeah, I like that. I'm kind of curious how you uh, kind of practice this relationship building, things you're doing on a regular basis to make sure that you're keeping in touch, not only with the people on your team, but also the different divisions. Because here at Experian, yeah, we're a huge organization, so many people, um, people are moving around. I'm just kind of curious about how you are just kind of diligent about building those relationships. Well, I've been very lucky this year. I I don't have one boss, I have two bosses. So I report to David Proctor, but I also report to Joe Talbot as as a dotted line. So I have a relationship in the Stan OEI's organization. And so it's been great using Joe's connections to his peers. I got a chance to be invited to Stan's staff meeting. And I know some of the, the, the folks but it's always trying to go out of your way. It, it sounds kind of cheesy, but in a room where you walk into for the first time, you don't know people. Yeah. My wife hates this, but I'm the guy that goes around and introduces myself to everybody. And she's like, oh, you know, like you go to a cocktail party, you're like, oh my God, see you really? And I do it because that's what my, uh, that's the way I was raised. Selfishly for business, I do it because I want to know those people and because there would be somebody that I may have heard their name and never known, and I want them to remember me because at some point in time, everybody, and this is it's so true, every business is going to have a breach at some point in time. And if people meet me and all they remember, oh, there's that Mike Bremer guy, he's the breach guy, and I'll find him, I can call him. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other, th- the other thing that also I think is really important in building relationships is t- to be able to mentor and give back. I do it selfishly because I get just as much as the people I mentor out as I hope they do in that relationship. And I'm one of the things that I'm really proud about, um, someone asked me the other day, how do you measure your career, you know, your professional career as a success. And I said, there are now 17 people that I've kept in touch with that are in my LinkedIn network that I worked with and, and supervised them as a frontline leader. Are they in my organization? And they have gone from being a frontline performer to at least a vice president or above in wow. their companies working now. Wow. And did I, did I develop all of them from start to finish? No, but I had a hand and I still keep in touch with them. And you know, I've been doing this for 35 years in business. And so I'm really proud of the fact that folks that I've had a hand in their career have actually done really well and contributed to their organization because of something that I did maybe way back when. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that. I love that you view your success um, you wrap it up into how have I helped other people yeah. on that path? I think that is, I think that's a, such a great way of looking at it. Um, I'm kind of curious about uh, going back to kind of you walk into a room and you're that guy who can just easily navigate the room and just and you talk about your wife like, oh, I hate this because she, she just wants to maybe be alone with you, or mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, I want to meet everyone. Uh, for those. Um, maybe like me, who maybe are more introverted, uh, we go into a room, Mike, and the last thing I want to do is talk to too many people. I want to maybe talk to one person. Um, but your style is that you, you know, you're very interested in getting to know people, and it's very easy for you. It sounds like to just walk up to people and start a conversation. But do you have any advice for those who are looking to expand their network? Maybe they're listening to you and they're like, "Yeah, you know what? I need to do a better job building relationships, meeting new people, expanding my network, because uh, it'll really help me just get my work done." That experience. Um, any advice for those who are maybe more hesitant uh, when they walk into a room or maybe they're just on campus and walking around and see people and they're just like, oh, I never talked to that person. Um, I need a little bit, a little, a little motivation uh, to go and do that. Well, no matter, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. I would say no matter how good you are at it, you always find someone who's even better at it. So a couple things 
if you're more of an introvert, you still have to know or want to know at least one person in, in the room at the cocktail party, in the meeting, at the subway terminal, whatever the case may be. If you're not comfortable with going up and making an introduction on your own, find somebody who knows that person and at least try that as a start. Mm. The, the second thing I would say is that there are some really good examples of how people do network and they may um, you know, try to schedule a coffee, try to go out and get involved in community service, um, be more involved in your church, um, get involved in an employee resource group. There's lots of ways to put you in touch with other people. And somebody says, well, wait a minute, I want to network with more people that can help me in business. Why would I want to do something with an employee resource group? Is because everybody in every group at Experian, regardless of the association, knows somebody that's involved with someone else that can help you out doing your job better. Mm -hmm. um, I use a case in point that I needed to have some tax documents done and someone that I didn't know. I mean, I knew a couple people in the tax department, but I didn't know this particular person. And I found out somebody through employee resource group. This is all I know. They're in the employee resource group, the sister group out in Costa Mesa. Let me make a phone call. And I got right to them. Mm. So there is truth to the six degrees of separation. There's not always the one way to get there. But just learn from other people, ask those questions, try, you know, different things, even, even if you're quiet about doing it. And other people will also give you advice, too. I mean, I've given you a couple pieces of advice, but there's lots of people that do it much better than I do. And I try to keep learning and see those techniques. And it, it's, a, it's very helpful to, to keep an open mind and always learn something new because the, the world's changing fast and the way people connect, especially on social media, yeah. um, it, it's changing the game big time. Right. We are coming up on our hour here, Mike, and the conversation has been amazing. So thank you. Um, do you have any final words for any of our emerging leaders who are listening to your episode? Well, um, I hope at least one person listens, but the, <laughs> the thing that I have up on my office wall that I always look at, and, and I, I don't have a lot of my, on my office wall, I'm a minimalist, as, as people know, but it's, it's the Teddy Roosevelt saying, and, and I'll read it to you, because I, I think it's fun, is, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong men stumble, or where the door or of deeds could have been done a little bit better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who at best knows in the end that the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Mm. Mm. That's a really That's good a final word. That's a fantastic <laughs> quote. I love that. It's really, really good. Yeah, I think it's called, I think the title of it is Man in the Arena. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I got that. My my wife was kind enough to give it to me Christmas a couple years ago, and I love it. <laughs> oh, I have one, one last question, Mike. Um, for all the young leaders listening in, maybe they're new to Experian, uh, maybe they're in their first year, second year. Um, what, if you were talking to the young Mike, uh, what leadership advice career advice would you give a young Mike? Because I think this would be helpful for all the young listeners listening in. I would take as many risks as you possibly can to do stuff that you're not necessarily comfortable with. My best learnings were at things that were broken or startups that I wasn't necessarily qualified or capable of doing at the time. But I was fortunate enough to have other people, particularly my boss at the time or other people said, Mike, I think you can do this. And, and I know there's nobody else that we have enough confidence in that can do it, so give it a shot. And at the same time, well, I, I never 
bombed or failed miserably, they always said, hey, Mike, if you give it your best and you fail, it's okay, we still have your back. But it wouldn't have been unless I took some of those chances and I would say I, I probably could have even taken more and you'll learn so much more and be better for it, both personally and professionally. That's really good. I think that's a good place to end the episode. Thank you so much for calling in and talking with us, Mike. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate it. It's been fun. You asked some very good questions. You always had a good practice at and oh, thinking about you. the questions. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Bye. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. See you all. Take care. Bye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Level Up. If you'd like to see a summary of today's show, you can go to the Experian blog. The short URL is just ex.pn slash level up. If you found any of the information today helpful, please consider supporting us by hitting subscribe or leaving us a review. Thanks for dropping in and giving us a listen, and we hope to see you again for our next episode. 